Okay, I think we can start now. Um, tonight, it is, this is very loud. Is this supposed to be this loud? No? Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome Lars Müller to the AA. To introduce him is not a simple task, as he is not a simple man. He is a publisher and a graphic designer, an editor, a teacher, and a humanist. And he frequents architecture schools. His work is often complex, always rich, and never forgettable. You may know him best as the producer of the most desirable of architecture books. You can usually recognize his work at first glance or a quick feel. It reveals itself through the sheer quality of printing and photography, the feel of the paper and the cloth binding, the clarity of design, and the carefully edited content. It comes as no surprise that everybody from Stephen Hall, Peter Zumthor, Zaha Hadid, from Saarbruch Hatten to Sanan, from Peter Eisenman to Herzog de Meuron, have done their best books with Lars. His respect for photography is exemplary, resulting in long-running, almost legendary collaborations with greats such as Helen Binet, who is with us tonight. The exceptional quality of Lars Müller's book, books is not only due to the freedom granted by his independence as a publisher, but also to his vision as a graphic designer. In parallel to Lars Müller Publisher, he runs Integral Lars Müller, an agency for visual communication and design that forms part of a transdisciplinary network called Integral Concept with bases in Paris, Milan, Zurich, Baden, and Montreal. Through his design agency that he set up in the early 80s in the Swiss spa town of Baden, where he is still based, Lars has produced work for clients such as Vitra, the Paris Museum of Modern Art, the Swiss Ministries of Foreign Affairs and Culture, Harvard University, the United Nations, the insurer Swiss Re, and many, many more. The fact that quite a few of his clients are political bodies reveals another facet of Lars Müller. His humanist interests have led him to produce a series of books that examine the current state of global civilization. This incredibly ambitious undertaking includes titles such as The Face of Human Rights, Who Owns the Water, Faith Is, and Cotton Worldwide. Lars has also made it his mission to republish the utopian writings of Buckminster Fuller that include his texts, ideas, and integrities and dedication automation, amongst others. Together with Jeffrey Inaba at Columbia University's C-Lab, Lars has recently published The World of Giving and a collaboration with Moisen Mostafavi and Harvard GSD titled Ecological Urbanism will come out next month. But not all of Lars Müller's work is aimed towards winning a Nobel Peace Prize. Some of his passions are more select. His book Helvetica, Homage to a Typeface, and the recent publication of Helvetica Forever, as well as his performance as a quirky tour guide in the 2007 film Helvetica, tells me that he can get quite excited at the sight of a sans serif font. But his true passion really lies in the creative exchange with other people. His books are testimony to this, and so is his activity as an educator. Lars Müller has taught at art academies in Zurich, Basel, Lyon, Leipzig, Karlsruhe, and Maastricht. Most recently, he has been a guest critic at Columbia and a guest lecturer at Harvard GSD. As a publisher, he regularly cooperates with the Canadian Center for Architecture, the New Museum in New York, Princeton, Harvard, and many other eminent institutions. On his website, Lars writes, of course using a Helvetica font, our publishing house makes no concessions to trends in fashion, except in cases where we subject them to thorough analysis. We focus on research complex subjects, sorry, focus on researching complex subjects, interrogating process and method, documenting historic milestones, and occasionally facilitating insights into exemplary praxis. On this occasion, it is an honor that, we will grant, that he will grant us an insight into his own exemplary praxis. Please join me in welcoming Lars Müller. Thank you, Oliver. It's all set. Um, well, I decided to focus on a topic tonight which uh, I hope you share some interest in, which is the role of the architect um, as an editor and an author, uh, and maybe explain some processes in bookmaking uh, in my own, ro own role as an editor of uh, books. But um, as the overall title was given by Communicating Architecture, I want to start uh, where we actually find ourselves in the media world today, which uh, definitely is dominated by the internet. And, um, well, 
I, I had some uh, smile at least uh, reading that headline, um, and uh, because um, and the picture to the left, I remember I've seen as a rendering three or four years ago uh, with some real some cranes built into the rendering, so it looked really like uh, uh, like it looked recently. Um, that is that brings up the question on which media um, are the right ones to communicate the very complex topics of architecture today. And I think that we do best if we think sharply about the division between, for example, the internet and the book, which I may have the right to concentrate on tonight. But to stay with the internet, I'm, I'm a frequent user, especially around topics of uh, architecture, design, and you know, where you may believe that there is reliable information stored on the internet. Um, and Architonic is one of the pages I use frequently because I think I can trust their information. Uh, and get some information on news and trends, as you see, or kind of an overview of the A to Z of arch or, or in architecture, or some historic uh, uh, information on personalities. But it never goes extremely deep. Of course, we also use the internet to uh, kind of get some insights into the practice of uh, the most uh, known or advanced uh, practices. And there again, you may, I don't know how much time you spend at the time, you know, or in one, one session uh, surfing through the internet. I don't really stand, stand it very long, but it gives you this kind of instant and very fast information on things. And when I found this image, I thought, as with the first image, is it real or not? I think that's something we really have to question ourselves. Uh, if I see the scale of that one person walking to the very right and the size of the people a lit little bit further away, a little bit further away. I think it, there is a, something fake here, otherwise it would be this kind of Zwerg und Riese, I don't know what that's in English. Anyway, so uh, the tricky thing with the internet is that it is based on the same medium, the computer, the screen, which is used to manipulate images as well. So um, every time we work with photographs, I, or when we work with photographs in architecture, I keep asking that question, what was manipulated or what was kind of uh, retouched or kind of was the sky that blue or, you know, were there any people in the, s in the, in the place? And very often architects uh, kind of delete the, peop the people or kind of the rubbish or the, the plugs or, you know, they manipulate the image in a way I think it's not always very helpful because they also delete atmosphere very often. This one is real. Um, I've seen it with my own eyes. So it is built and it's a library and libraries are today maybe uh, containers for multimedia or uh, information um, brought along in uh, multimedia, including books. Um, and I think that's my trust I would love to like to share with you in bookstores. I hope you have a favorite one. Maybe there is a cat there. This is uh, Spoonbill and Sugartown, my favorite bookstore in New York. 
uh, Brooklyn, um, second-hand bookstores, wonderful places. It's kind of Saturday afternoons, and you will get more than what you can carry home uh, by inspiration looking through books, or your own library, or my warehouse. Uh, these are the dimensions given by the book. And of course, um, I have some difficulties with this stack because it, the books are meant to be spread out and um, you know to reach people wherever they have a desire in in owning a book. Um, I think sometimes publishers may overreact in times of media competition by uh, searching in the wrong direction. So, um, and, and that, was, that was a certain tendency if, if you, probably there is no space in the bookstore downstairs to, s to carry those books, but uh, there are even some in architecture which have this kind of oversize and overweight, and I think it's, uh, it's a kind of uh, panic reaction, which uh, may remind us about some happenings in evolution where it went wrong also for these uh, species. Um, another aspect we should take into consideration is um, self-publishing. I think, um, I, I believe many of you or some of you already have some experience. What I think is inter most interesting here is uh, the ebook architect, which I respect because I also refer to architecture sometimes in my process of making. But on the very top, I think it's very encouraging to hear that there is a writer in all of us, and uh, that once this is said, that you are really um, invited to publish your own book and make huge money with it. Actually, that's said on the next page. Uh, large profits. Hmm? Publish and sell your ebook online for large profits. The sentence marked on the bottom is also very nice. 25% profit offered by most traditional business and much better than. Uh, the small percentage that authors are offered by traditional publishing houses. Um, maybe disappointing to you that nowadays, in at least if you're not a star architect, is that the, the term? Uh, you may have to pay for your book. Hmm? So maybe you're better off in self-publishing. Well, that said, uh, ironically said, so you understand. It is just the case that the role of the editor, well, in this case, you would be the author, but uh, it's no, there is no guarantee that you will just do the right thing for your readers. Well, um, what I mean is the role of the editor and eventually the publisher is to, is to filter and to transform information into a format which based on his knowledge or experience may be appropriate for the audience. And somehow I feel, because I'm, I'm really interested in this, uh, this uh, development in self-publishing, and I even uh, offer my, my, um, my advice or my critic to some uh, self-publishers, but I think the crucial thing is the lack of distance or this, the lack of communication in the process of making. Um, your friends may be as diligent as you and may just encourage you for pragmatic reasons. Um, it's just easier to say, oh, it's all right, it's good, it looks great. While a publisher, by the means of his profession, will always negotiate and always try to um, to bring things further in a way of uh, selecting and sequencing and 
and um, maybe you know create complexity rather than than uh, the most impressing uh, collection of materials. Well, um, that's why, well, how I refer to architecture by building books um, based on a very strong belief and experience of process and continuity in process. You all know that uh, where to start, where to start a building, that you have a to create a, a strong and, and reliable uh, basement first, and that may carry um, the whole building, and may already include lots of uh, ingredients which are uh, very vivid for, for the function of the building. But because the self-publishers, uh, well, the e-book uh, architects, are now claiming the role of the architect, I refer to another experience we may all share, which is the process of cooking. And there again, I, I believe that it's very obvious that you have a linear process of creation, of making, which may start in a marketplace where you may be overwhelmed by the offerings. and but you will also be in inspired by what you see and it will kind of set free some, some uh, fantasy or some um, or also courage to uh, maybe combine things which are not meant obviously to be combined or to be brought into a close neighborhood um, like in a book. Uh, if you keep the tomatoes in mind, just having three sizes or three kinds of tomatoes, uh, make your selection and combine it well with other ingredients. Uh, the next step, if you did some inspired shopping on the market, will be what the chefs call the mise en place, which is the preparation of these ingredients uh, for cooking, the process of cooking as the probably most inspired or creative or, or kind of genuine uh, process in uh, authors and editors' life. But the preparation before should be very rational, very well thought, very complete, um, and um, well, with a certain refrain from emotions. Of course, then, the process of cooking is uh, something you can mostly not share with too many people. Um, we have a saying in German which uh, means that too many cooks will uh, spoil the, yeah? The broth. Okay, yeah. The broth, okay. Um, so, um, leave it to the most experienced or to the most skilled person. Well, if that's kind of a prologue to the role of the architect as an author and editor, um, I think, again, we should remember and refer to history. And I have my, uh, you know, over the years, you, you kind of get, come across the same examples again and again. And uh, not that Corbusier is more or very respected in Switzerland for his role as a, a book author and editor, but um, at least his oeuvre is collected in many uh, libraries. So I had a chance, together with uh, Catherine Desmet, a um, French uh, art historian, to work on a publication <coughs> on Corbusier's books. And it's really amazing that over 50 years he wrote uh, designed and edited uh, 54 publications, and he is uh, seen as the author of 39 of them. And um, I think many of them are legendary in the history of architecture and uh, icons in uh, architecture publishing of the 20th century. I concentrate on very few names here now, but if you if you 
take a closer look, then you will realize that Frank Lloyd Wright, for example, built his career on, on publishing, on writing, on altering, on visions in urban planning and uh, housing. And so did uh, Corbusier uh, very early, but he always had this uh, ambition also to get his hands on the design of the books, which makes it more attractive also for me. Uh, some sketches are just wonderful to look at. And this is one of my favorites, um, beautiful maquette uh, in the archives in Paris. La, uh, La Petite Maison is uh, the house Corbusier built for his mother in 1924, and he published a book on the same house in 1954, um, encouraged by a publisher. And that again was Hans Giersberger, the publisher or the, in or the founder of uh, Artemis uh, Publishing House in Zurich, uh, responsible for many famous uh, books on architecture, Alvar Aalto, Richard Neustra, and the, the Oeuvre raisonné by of uh, Corbusier. So this book is kind of square, and al almost square in this size, and it carries a very intimate uh, story, written, told, told in drawings, photographs, and plans on that house, um, which I think is, for me, kind of a exemplary architecture publication. It is available as a reprint also. Um, I took this little booklet as a starting point for a course I taught at the GSD, Harvard GSD. Um, and it made the ha first half of, of the course handing over all the information written and drawn and photographed in this little booklet in a digital format to the students, asking them to, to comment, to re-edit uh, for a contemporary audience and to add comments in writing or in, in uh, visuals. And I just show you one example, which is uh, a pop-up book of the same content. Uh, one, well, my favorite, it was kind of a playful course to just to introduce the book as a three-dimensional physical object to the students, which I figured out. Uh, we did this kind of anonymous um, questionnaire about their use of, or habits, or use of books. And there were some, I could say shocking, but I was kind of expecting uh, uh, some um, kind of dark reality. Um, like the average, the average uh, library they, they owned or carried along with them was uh, kind of eight or nine books. Um, and, I was, and there was one guy who, was, who, who said he, had, he owns 100 books or so. So that makes the average uh, more, more uh, significant. Anyway, they at the end uh, became partly or Part, some of them became real book lovers. And uh, I think this one is a nice example of an interpretation of Corbusier's passion put into that little booklet. And here um, it's also kind of emphasizing the three-dimensional appearance of the book. Uh, I think it's very nice. Uh, another person or personality of this dimension is uh, Buckminster Fuller, who um, I actually met through that book, which, which I published in 1996 or 7, and um, which taught me to believe and trust in visual information, which can be the, or kind of offer access to deeper information, to, to written to text, to uh, slogans, and um, I think it was the birth of what I 
today called a visual reader, which is a book which uh, contains 60 or 70 percent uh, vis visuals, but still a good part of essential uh, writing. And it was also where I first tested, um, you know, graphic designers count the text per page in characters or words. And I started testing how much time does it take to read a text in a certain size on a, on a spread or a page of a book. So that gives a, a certain uh, uh, information on, on, you know, how long can you read to stay within the rhythm of visual reading. Now there are other people uh, today, you know these two guys, of course, um, who are very much into uh, publishing, writing, authoring, and editing books. And just to say, they both uh, wrote published books before they built their first building, and that should be encouraging, you know, even or if the market is short in jobs you have an alternative in publishing a book. Uh, Peter Eisenman, that's his, actually his, his first book. It's his PhD, which I offered him to publish as a reprint of the very original, which he delivered uh, as a PhD at Cambridge University, UK, in 63. And it contains, um, I think he, he had to apply for, um, to be allowed to change the format because PhDs were always delivered in A4. And he said, well, A4 doesn't work for my, uh, in this case, I need a square format. So to have the, the drawings on the left side and the writing on the right. And um, yeah, I think that was a lucky uh, decision, which came by the fact that the ETH in Zurich offered uh, Eisenman to translate his PhD and they made a really ugly uh, paperback out of it. And I was, uh, I joined uh, Eisenman to the book launch and I saw how disappointed he was and uh, just made him the offer the, the same night to just to, you know, get his mood back. Um, and I think it deserves because it's so obsessive. It's also a good example, you know, a very encouraging in a way to say that one, if you go, f go for publishing, then you should, uh, should really go for the maximum. Um, I invited Iceman to write an afterword, which he did. This is showing somehow strange. Um, this is another book which I consider an author's book and which also did not happen just by chance. It, it was um, a very long process in finding the right structure, the right way to, uh, to, to make the author, the architect, the author and make the author feel comfortable as the author, which is not the classical role of the architect, of course. And uh, Zumthor at that time had already uh, kind of 15 or 20 years history in his practice and some remarkable buildings built. But there was a fact that by the time he was recognized through his uh, recent work, uh, the thermal bath in uh, Vals, many people actually offered him to write his monograph, to write on his work and um, Peter had a hard time taking decision. Who should I allow? Kenneth Frampton or uh, uh, Achleitner or who could it be? And um, there was just a lucky moment where he was undecided and I was able to convince him that he could be the author himself. And the others may find other occasions to write on his work. Um, I'm not always that uh, suspicious, but in this case, I thought these, whoever writes will, will write, uh, will, will 
celebrate Zumthor and not write a critical uh, text. So rather have himself celebrate or be critical. I think it would be more honest. But not only that, um, I think the other lucky decision we took uh, was to invite Helen Binet to re-photograph all the buildings and um, to make to create a, a certain consistency uh, in in uh, the visual expression of the architecture. And I was especially happy about this decision because Zumthor's archive, as many architects' photo archives, over 15 or 20 years uh, in every period uh, will more likely document the evol evolution of architecture photography rather than the work of the architect. And by, um, by including Helene as a co-author in the book, there was a certain guarantee for this visual consistency, although there were 15 years between the buildings and very huge difference in scale and mat materiality. But um, in, uh, in the kind of visual language of the photographer, there was a very high um, identity factor for the, for the book. Again, writing was not about the length of the text, but the, the content and the density. And every single word in this book is written by Peter Zumthor. I think many other publishers, but other, also other architects, try to adapt to that format. Uh, well, I leave it to you to, to judge, but um, I think also because of the very patient and passionate process, there is a certain balance. And I think there is a, a s also a, a kind of an, I wouldn't say an absence of design, but there is a very, very um, generous presence of design. It's not about, about uh, well graphic, graphic design doesn't matter in books, actually. It's just a kind of an instrument to transform content. And another decision taken was to not, not to redraw any of the, of the plans or drawings, which uh, at that time it was the early age of the, the computer-aided uh, uh, design drawings. Uh, and many monographs at that time, they kind of redrew also historic material. And because Zumthor's drawings also show the evolution of, of architecture drawing from, from very careful pencil drawings like uh, these ones uh, up to, up to uh, computer drawn plans. So that also gives kind of a timeline, and time is very crucial in this, in this uh, presentation of the architecture because it also, as you see here, it has a uh, meaning also in the, cho in the choice of material, in, uh, in the process of developing the project, and also the trust, like with when you live in the mountains, you will trust that things will age well if they are done well. So the only pieces in color were some indications of material in for every building. So just to give some typical uh, color information on the building's material. This was actually the most recent 
building besides the uh, museum in Bregenz. And I think it's also important, also there are not many human beings or many people uh, present in the, in, the, in the photographs, but there are some traces of use here and there and also some views out of the building and into the landscape. So you get the feeling of the atmosphere uh, the building sits in. I think when, when actually I'm sometimes asking back pe to people or I could ask you, well, why do you especially like this book? And, uh, you know, if we, if we spend some time discussing and analyzing, then um, these two terms will, will uh, show up. And sometimes um, they are seen as a, juxtaposition, which they aren't. Actually, simple, simplexity or, uh, or simplicity is, is, not, is not just simple, right? And uh, I think it combines very well through a very thoughtful process with uh, this aim for complexity, which, um, and I'm, s I'm sorry, Helen, it, I just happened to be you <laughs> again. Uh, Helene introduced me to Tsar Hadid, who she had worked for for quite some time. And we, together with Markus, no, that wasn't, was that Markus Sohanshi uh, at the studio? Uh, we developed, and with Tsar, of course, we developed this publication, which happened to be her first book or real documentary on her built work, which consists of two buildings by that time. And again, it was this, at least with me, I learned so much from Helene through um, the Zumthor book that I had this absolute trust in the, the power of, of uh, photography to express the building also in a dimension where the photography may have a certain abstraction or add a certain abstraction and the, the layout may even add a bit more to this. So as a viewer, you are not only um, confronted with a representation of the building, but also with an interpretation by the photographer, but if I may say also by the designer and the publisher. I think the, the least to say had the architect in this process. So it was actually delegating, uh, different to, to the Zumthor book, it was delegating the view on the architect's work to the photographer and the designer publisher. Which uh, in many cases became, if I may say, my advantage to play both roles uh, the role of the publisher and the, the designer. So the team was always quite small and uh, easy to overlook. Uh, so um, yeah, it was never too much discussion about design, if I remember right. It, was, it just happened, more or less. And sometimes, as here, also the format um, is inspired by, or inspired, developed out of the photography, which is uh, a, a spread, like you see here, is uh, in the proportion of a four by five uh, image. And there was an agreement that we would not crop the images, but still allow bleeding pages. So that made the kind of elegant vertical format of the book, which makes it also rec recognizable, I think, in shelves and tables. I think I have to speed up a bit, otherwise you will. Uh, this is the third one uh, on, uh, or the second one on Saadit, and the third one with photographs by Helene. And here, um, or by, by that time, my 
strategy in cover design was to try to to develop the cover out of the content. So the book was always designed completely and then the cover uh, was an interpretation of the building in a way. So the cover became a relief uh, inspired by the real facade of the building. And uh, al also, maybe also as a reaction on, on some digital examples, you know, to play uh, maybe here to play with the physicality of the book where here of course this is, this is fake it's, it looks very three dimensional it uh, looks very like a relief but it's not it was a heavy lithography work so we kind of manipulated the photographs and kind of merged it into the, the paper to make it look like a relief and look like the photographs as well. So this may be another category of um, books because it is um, very text uh, heavy content. And uh, to say the role of the editor in this case is which, which was uh, Philipp Ursprung, and uh, maybe if you say the, vis the visual, well, there is an editor for the visual part as well, which I played as a, the role I played as a publisher, and it's a collaboration between the two. And editing here means to, um, of course, invite the writers to write, but then also to sequence or structure the book and to combine combine uh, writing and, and illustration in a way it is not um, only, well, the visuals are not only serving the texts, which I think would not be appropriate to the content, but also not for the, there's something wrong with this format, but, okay. Um, so we decided to structure the book and to separate uh, the visuals from the from the writing, uh, in a way of allowing some text illustrations, but then also to uh, create some portfolios where we kind of have a more extensive visual language used, and more an expression of the architect's uh, vision and and work. So this is kind of a classical. Uh, what we call the Boston style. It's the American East Coast uh, standard in, uh, in writing. So how, how much text per page, how many characters per, per line and so on. And this is the, an example for the, the cahier, the portfolio of the architect, uh, printed on a thinner paper, on a coated paper while the texts are on a bulky, uncoated paper, very touchy. So you have a haptic feeling, you get, you get kind of a uh, relationship to the book as, a, as an object. There are hardly any photographs of, uh, of buildings. It's really about process. It's about the inspiration and uh, of the architects, you know, what, where do they get inspirations from, and how do they handle, collect, and communicate that material. And again, the design is, of course, to sequence the pages and to, to combine images and, uh, and to kind of treat the image in the right way. But again, I would say there is a certain absence of visible design, visible graphics, at least. Um, I have a series of covers here showing that uh, where maybe, well, if you know some of our books, then you may find out that they are mainly, they mainly have typographic covers. They, I hardly use uh, any image. 
probably if I would use photographs, drawings, art, artwork on the cover if I would do n publish novels. So if there would be no visuals in the, in the content, I would probably go for heavily visual covers. But in case of architecture, photography, art, I really prefer uh, typographic covers, but in a wide range of combining mater materials or choosing materials appropriate to the content and really build, build the book and create kind of an architecture of the book. And try to interpret really pretty some are bigger interpret the content and the work of the artist which here is playing with the point of view the point of view uh, actually I, I was I never thought about the Swiss cross but I was told it's it's uh, I must have been inspired so this is my favorite out of the book. There are 800 pictures in the book, but this is definitely the shoe repair, Starshine on Broadway. I tried to buy this, this piece, but uh, he didn't want to sell. So, uh, this is a book, the book coming out next month. There's an embossed, sil silver embossed uh, plan of uh, the, the water supply system of Guadalajara in Mexico. And as Oliver mentioned that I, I tried to, uh, I must confess actually that I was a bit angry about myself when I first realized that I, I felt some, uh, or I felt uh, attracted or drawn into social questions or aspects uh, and and but very late you know then you say why didn't you realize that with the age of 35 you, well but then you have to realize you can't because you have to learn your lessons first so once I felt I've learned my lessons in the use of images and in the transformation of content by the use or the the, the engagement of visual information or visual uh, instruments, I th thought I could, without giving up this niche of beauty of architecture, design, and art, um, I could try to, to um, transform content which is not meant to be visual. Like lawyers would say, well, human rights, that's, these are laws, these are written laws which you you uh, may interpret but if you try to make it visual then you may have a hard time because you will always end up showing suffering uh, torture victims or starving babies or um, name it um, and then I realized that the visuality of human rights could be or human rights could be expressed visually by, by searching for a balance of normality and violence. And by searching for, for expression of respected human rights, like a photograph of us here in this, in this room, talking freely and, and uh, exchanging opinions, not being watched. I don't know where the cameras are, but, well, it, there is one there, but, uh, um, anyway, you know what I mean. It's uh, an expression of freedom is, is shown in normality in everyday life. So, of course, you may have, or this girl may have some desires, but she's not starving. She's probably pretty happy and privileged in her uh, social environment. Um, again, this, this iron rule of balancing text and image in a way you can kind of, the thing is if you, if you go through, a, flip through a, 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 a thick book, you get into a certain rhythm. You may even, if you watch yourself, your, 
your pulse may s slow down and you breathe regularly. You get into kind of a yoga-like experience. Um, and if you, if you get into that rhythm that can go on for very long, then you should not be disturbed or interrupted by, uh, by too long reading. So I thought that uh, maybe for fast readers two, but slow readers four minutes of reading should be the maximum which you should allow yourself in this, in this rhythm of watching uh, images. And in this case, I must say that uh, I am one of the co-editors because the other editors are lawyers, specialists in human rights. Also, I initiated the project, but the content, the resp responsibility, of course, was uh, with them. And the rule set for the image research was that every image must be factually real so there is no n there is no image that is just interpreting a certain feeling or a certain happening or violence or so it's absolutely it's a document for what happens um, for for what is uh, meant to be shown right um, there's one ch one chapter here um, also, this, this spiral, just to say, this is the table of contents. And if you, it would be 58 centimeters long, drawn uh, in a line. So I had to make a spiral. But the spiral is also meaningful for life. So if you have the right to life in the center, and if, you, if we agree and we accept and we, we, we defend the right to life, then we have lots of consequences to face, which is the right to food, the right, uh, the right to education, to health, to housing, uh, everything, and also the protection for di from discrimination and protection from, from torture, ending up with political rights, which are at the almost the end of the spiral, which mean the formation of society, the, the, the kind of the creation of state which will then again protect the right and ensure the right to life and um, so the spiral becomes uh, kind of obvious and in this case or every chapter was introduced by a triptychon uh, showing the, the, the extremes in a way and the center may say that there is enough food for everyone but there is a political um, uh, strengths or uh, so the, the distribution is just wrong. It's a problem of distribution or hunger is used as a weapon. And in many cases there is uh, there are political reasons or causes by uh, in the background. Uh, some factual information is given in very straightforward way. The colors are very often asked why why these colors, which are disturbing the image, and yes, they may do, but um, to have these colors structure the, the 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 book in these thirteen chapters, I also express that it is definitely not the photo book. It's not it's not celebrating the photographs. It's not uh, it's it's paying respect to the photo authors, but it's, it's not about their work. It's using their, uh, their photographs to express something, something higher and something more complex. Um, and here, here you may have this contrast of, of violent, violated human rights and, and respected human rights. You may, it's really everyday, everyday situation in many different cultures. You know, you, you, if you have enough food, you, you have already solved probably one of the main problems. If you have a roof above your head and uh, if you can enjoy eating together, I think that's something that in every society is a very, very strong expression of, of peace, 
peaceful coexistence of, of individuals. So normality is probably most expressed in this, such faces. Um, and also every culture celebrates. So birthday, from birthday to funerals, they are celebrated through, through uh, food and eating together and uh, spending time together. Hmm. So here, obviously, the text, te there's more text than you can uh, absorb in four minutes. Um, and it's what I say, if you have this horizontal reading in the rhythm of the, of the visuals, um, and you may spend some minutes reading a, a generously presented text, then you may see it as a kind of a surfing move while uh, all of a sudden you may be drawn into the topic uh, further and you may want to dive deeper into or dig deeper into the content and you may even uh, recognize that the source of the texts are more often uh, URLs leading out of the book. So actually you, you dig out into the book and through the book into the internet where you may find hundreds of pages, you know, giving you further information on the topic. So this kind of the, vert the horizontal move and the vertical uh, move. So swim and dive. <coughs> and the captions, uh, that was another remark. Uh, people saying, oh, it's so annoying, I have to turn the book around every time I want to read the caption. And, uh, uh, well, that's actually the meaning. You have to watch first and understand the image before you really go for the factual information, which is really, f it's not narrative, it's really f the fact where, what, where, and when. And um, so I think it was appropriate to put them vertical. Top left is said to be Leonardo DiCaprio's favorite dish. Uh, and and here, here we may be at the, out at the edge of normality. You know, if you, if you say the, viol the violence of human rights, normality, huge spectrum of normality, and then at the, at the edge of normality, you may have people losing respect or, lo or kind of losing control or awareness, awareness of their privilege. And, um, and now, uh, this is a picture I regret, I regret I have it in, I must say. I wouldn't put it in because I think this person may not be alone as responsible for, <laughs> for the situation she's in. So I think it's not a very informative image at all. Uh, every chapter ends with a juxtaposition of two images which have a similar visual expression for very different uh, appearances, which on the left side is in the, in the um, uh, I think it's in Sarajevo, when after several weeks there was a bread delivery and of course, everyone was eager to get as much as uh, he or she could. And to the right is uh, in uh, France. Um, there is one supermarket chain, which is well frequently offering this kind of quarter to seven, fifty percent discount. So everything you can grab within the next fifteen minutes will cost half of the list price. And um, so, you know, in, in this dimension you may say, well, probably there is a lot of visual or visuality in, in, uh, in human rights or in every content if you just go beyond your, your 
habits, in your visual habits. We are kind of, we are too, too uh, literally in, in, in our visual descriptions. I think we are, we are too, uh, also kind of, um, we absorb too much visual inf uh, information, of course, but if you, if you kind of use the image as you use your language, you know, if you try to explain something to me, you may search for words to get more precise and more, you may maybe even poetic in a way. You may try to impl to include some atmosphere in your saying, and you search for, you know, red is not red. It's this kind of mm. red. Mm? And if you if you do the same, or or I I at least found out for myself, if you do if I do the same with photographs, if I say okay, this image is ex expressing factually what I'm searching for, but it's not carrying it. On it's not it's not the right image to transport the, the the emotions or the the full dimension. Then you search further, and finally we we were kind of re searching, reviewing 10, 20 images just to find one that was fitting into to the sequence. And I think that's something that uh, is just typical for the process of editing that you can. You should not give up. It's not a pra pragmatic process. It's a, it's a unique and very inspiring process. Um, very few images on, on a second uh, publication in that same area, uh, which I initiated and edited with um, a professor at the ETH in Zurich. The question was simple, who owns the water? That's German title. Um, who owns the water? I don't know. Uh, I still don't know. But I figured out, and that was actually the starting point of the project, where, uh, you know, you happen to drink uh, San Pellegrino in Hong Kong and uh, uh, Fiji water in London. Um, and you ask yourself, why and what for? And what does that mean and express? while you know that one billion people are suffering from not having clean and potable water. So to communicate that to a mainly privileged society, which uh, but still are responsible, you, you may say, well, the problem is far away. What can I do? You know, I can't send my water down there or so. Um, but hmm, who's doing that? So um, the, the idea of to communicate to our society that there is a responsibility in our behavior. Also, we cannot, it's not about just saving water. It's about an, an understanding and an experience or the experience of solidarity with something that is maybe ha happen, happening far away. And the phenomenon of water is that scientists say that they know almost nothing about the water. It's just a, such a genius molecule that um, you may say it, it must, it's much more complex than science today even can, can really figure out. And to visualize this, you, you may, or I'm, I decided to search for dimensions. You know, what are the dimensions, the visual dimensions or visually expressed dimensions of water? And if you say water is life, or life is based on water, then that, that must have been true throughout the existence of this planet, or, or as long as there has been life. And uh, to contrast, uh, and I was lucky to find these two bluish photographs, but I would have gone for them even in other colors, but to have this um, fossil animal kind of I think 20 million years old, and this almost instant life or immediate life of an of a, a embryo, I think, was, uh, became a key, key image couple for me for this book, um, or for this topic, actually. And um, while the water offers many beautiful imi uh, images, of course, the book contains some simple graphics, but again, to make it very obvious, you know, that something must be wrong 
here and uh, not meant to be. Um, this may be very kitschy, but uh, uh, it's not so impossible because there is a quality of the water that it offers a surface which can at least, uh, well, you may have that experience if you jump into water and uh, what we call a randster, what you, can, you can't say that. Huh? Okay, when you, when you uh, it, it may hurt, water can be very hard as it can be very soft as well. Um, and human beings are kind of arranging with the water which is around them. If you have little, you, you just uh, uh, handle it differently than uh, if you have to dig a hole into the ice before you can get out the fish. But the book is offering some very kind of poster-like uh, uh, quotes and some very obvious and sometimes also déjà vu. But that was actually a part of, I must say here that the book was also meant to enter into uh, schools, like on college level. Um, so the idea was to combine this kind of déjà vu, uh, known images, kind of cliché or, or standards, uh, visual standards, with some unseen and unexpected images. Everything is a little bit too big here, I don't know why. But again, the, the image research was fact, very fact-based. It was not, oh, what could, what could be nice here and so. It was really uh, the, the, the script, like the storyboard, uh, uh, as if you would edit a film or you, you would kind of uh, create a film. You would set up a storyboard first and then you visualize the storyboard. And uh, that's something designers don't don't believe. They think they are looking or searching for some beautiful images. And that's why they are not editors, right? Designers are not necessarily editors. I, won't, I would like to say the editor may become or be a designer, but not the other way around. And um, once you look at, at, a, at an image long enough, then you may really get behind its, uh, its, its con content dimension and you combine and you sequence, you create a sequence and you kind of put the right image in the right place where it makes an expression that carries a even political uh, message along. Well, talking about political dimensions here, uh, I would like to say towards the end uh, that I strongly believe that architects and designers are political beings and uh, should start early enough in their career to implement some political dimensions or some beliefs, some principles into their practice. Otherwise, you may become the victim of, of kind of power-led uh, strategies. And I think that um, I would rather say that we should believe in the power of creativity and of creation, which um, I maybe I have focused on this little territory of bookmaking, but uh, you as architects, you may have much more power in changing structures or, or kind of uh, uh, influencing the experience of people in, in uh, cohabitation or in uh, uh, cultural exchange and so forth. And um, if you happen to have a chance to express your thoughts and your beliefs or your ideas in books, just do it and find an editor who may help you. And if you're lucky, you even find a publisher. And as a last message, be selective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lars. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, 
Hello. Um, thank you. Uh, I, at the beginning, I thought you might um, say something, might act as a kind of um, uh, oracle uh, in relation to the future. Um, when you're talking about the internet and the relationship between books mm -hmm. and, and internets, and I guess, mm -hmm. my, basically, my, my question is that, I mean, it's commonly understood that art publishing and architecture publishing is a, is a specialist mm -hmm. domain of, of the publishing world. And as such, runs on a sort of on business models that are quite different to, let's say, mainstream publishers. Mm -hmm. So it's very unlike, you know, it's whereas um, a novelist may get an advance and, you know, and then there may be royalties, et cetera, et cetera. G generally, the, the, the business model for, um, for, for art and architecture publishing is, is quite a different thing. And as you said yourself, often the author has to pay, mm -hmm. you know, which, which leads to the kind of, uh, you know, the, sub the other way of describing it, which is boutique publishing, right? But I was wondering whether, because obviously we, we, we're very aware that mainstream publishing is, is undergoing like a, a really drastic and in perhaps even fatal kind of yeah. transition at the moment, which, uh, you know, is due to too many reasons. One of which is, of course, the internet and, and, and the kind of pressure that, say, the music industry has, 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 sat, has publicly endured over the last 10 years. But you know, with the advent of the Kindle and the, I, I, and the soon to be iPad, obviously that, that whole, that pressure, that, that, that potential deluge that we've seen in the music industry may, may hit mainstream publishing. I'm wondering whether, whether all of this kind of hysteria and, and worry affects you as a specialist publisher um, or not, because in, in, in a sense, if, you're, if your business model and your economy has always been somehow specialist and and not so tied let's say to huge sales figures but relatively modest sales figures at, and distribution and so on and so forth how, how do you see the future for yourself but also for these the sort of specialist publishing All right um, well my business is not so much affected by new media but by the cannibalism amongst book publishers. There are just far too many books published. And not because there are the more and more people go to, you know, change for electronic media. It's just it has become a business which is only interesting in the huge dimension. So um, I'm I'm happy to announce that I'm the owner of my company again since after five years of collaboration with a larger company and I just realized that um, as, as beautiful as small may be you know as as dangerous and difficult it is because the book is a product which has has lost value instead of gaining value you know a book a book today costs half as much as it would have cost it 20 years ago. And that's wrong because the value of the book is increasing. It's growing. And uh, that system leads to, you know, then if, if you go like a discounter, you know, it has to sell a lot to make a, a, an, an earning. And, and that's actually what, what a danger for this kind of niche products, like many uh, architecture or art publishers are in. Um, what I believe, which is much more important, is that that uh, if I try to strengthen my profile, I think I have nothing to fear, because there will always be enough people, you know, within the niche, or the niche will be big enough for the dimension I am actually aiming for. So um, I'm knock on wood or what you say. Uh, but what I, what I o want to say and why I'm not nervous hmm, is because I think these are the, 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 me the new media, digital media are in their child shoes hmm, and all almost gr growing out of their child shoes and probably it's still in their child shoes which are a little bit tight now. So they, it's kind of 
uh, they are struggling. You know, the, like iPad is a, just a ridiculous toy. You know, there is no, there is no comfort in this piece. But there is a huge promise. And I will be the first one carrying kind of one meter books in an iPad along with me when I go on vacation somewhere. Or I would be pleased to read the newspaper and even watch the news, Im news photographs or images on, on uh, the iPad. But I would, re would resist in looking at the photo book or an art book on the iPad. Hmm? And now, it's something I would say if we, and I think we have learned, it's like with food, you know, I cannot celebrate a kind of three course dinner every night. So I kind of, I kind of uh, uh, make a difference between nutrition, which can be healthy and ple uh, pleasant and tasty every day. Uh, otherwise, I may refuse and say no dinner tonight. And this kind of big fest and, and dinner with friends and so on Saturday. So if you do that with media, then I think you may, you may automatically make the right choice. And then hopefully you will pay for the pleasure you have with a book and pay less for the information which will be also cheap and accessible through, through new media. And I think that's a process that may start now when, uh, when digital media come into that, let, let's say, become more mature and ma more, more reliable and, 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 and yeah, with a bit more comfort, I would say. And, um, then people may get back to reality and, and realize what, what life is really. It's, uh, and, and life will remain physical. It's, you know, uh, there is no replacement of real sex. And I would just say, take the book as a very erotic uh, object, which, which is just great to touch and carry and, and feel. It's, uh, and no, no new media can replace that really. But you should be willing to pay for it. I think that's the crucial point. Does that, does that answer your question? <laughs> well, I'm not an oracle. I can just uh, def try, try to, to cultivate my optimism. Yeah, there is one question in the back. The uh, yeah. No, okay, hi. Um, I have a question regarding a design decision, I would say. Um, as I had to discover in bookstores many times that often your books don't, or had, I don't think ever, have, and I'm missing an English word, I'm German. So, um, like the cover around the book, like an extra yeah, layer of paper. Jacket, yeah. The jacket, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know if there's any other publishers <laughs> that do it as, as strictly as you do that they just don't have it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just interested in knowing how come you come to this decision. I really like it, but I also really like the moment to sort of undress the book. So <laughs> yeah. you were just saying yeah. something about erotic issues and books, whatever. I like to see the very spaces, like with its dress on, as I call it, uh -huh. personally, and to take it off. So you um, never yeah. have that. Just Okay, that, that's a decision you must take. You can't, can't, you can't have both, you know, pleasure at once, right? Either you, either you, you, well, if you cover the body of your, of course you can, you can uh, uh, uncover. Um, and it's my first, my first uh, act when I, when I, or second, when I look through a book and I'm interested in content, I have a good feel, then I will certainly take off the, the jacket. Well, I was interested the, <laughs> the thing is that the jacket is a protection of the book, you know, or it is a marketing uh, tool, you know, it's uh, where you, 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 sometimes marketing, if they, if they insist on jackets and colorful and, and, uh, and uh, this kind of, uh, yeah, catchy images, they say, well, if you don't like it, you can take it off. Huh? And, you know, because I have no marketing people above me, um, 
they, they had no chance because I think of, of the book as an as a integral object. So the, like o uh, Oliver gave you the story of my studio. It's, uh, so the integrality, can you say that in English? The, the, the hmm? No, I, I mean the, the, the most complete integrity, integrity also. Well, okay, so you know what I mean. It's, it's just if I, if I create the book, and then I pack it afterwards. It's and for 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 some minor reasons, which is kind of better selling or uh, uh, if it's for protection, it's all right. But I I like the uh, well what we said in the beginning. What I like about Zumthor's buildings that they age well, that they show some traces of use and the weather and oh, you know I love traces of use on books. The, the face of human rights had to be a white book, you know? And if it's yours, there will be your traces of use. Hmm? And if there would be a jacket around that, would that be the starving child or would that be, you know? You would always feel intrigued by the fact that the object is covered. I would. So, but you're right, it's a decision. It's like typographic covers. That's what I was thinking because mm -hmm. you, uh, you were, um, yeah, saying something about mm -hmm. that you hardly ever have pictures on your on your books, so I mm -hmm. that's one decision. Mm -hmm. Second one can't have a jacket yet. Yeah, and well, I I, I have to believe what I, I hear more often that that uh, I don't compare very much with uh, all the publishers, but what I hear is that my books have this kind of object quality in a certain variation. There is no standard. There is no series. So every book kind of finds uh, an, an expression or a, a, a personality in, in its materiality or its uh, design, finally. And I think I couldn't do that with jackets. So Thank you. I am quite curious of your workshop in, in Harvard, um, just more of like, I mean, it's the same topic as this talk. But I'm just really curious of, um, I mean, apart from what you said, you're encouraging people to publish content. Mm -hmm. um, but apart from just, you know, just get your ideas out, first question would be like, what kind of ideas would you push for us to even think about? What kind of angle? I mean, is it really just anything? That's one. And then the second one, in the workshop in, in Harvard, I'm just curious, did people have anything in mind about, um, it, um, basically just the idea of like, is there a new way in which architecture could be communicated Apart from what is already uh, what it already is right now, um, in your in the workshop or in your point of view, because of the complexity. Because right now I just feel like um, it is a very complex situation. So I'm just curious of how how do you think what's, what's the recommendation to communicate really complex data, mm. in which architecture could be you know disseminated mm. or understood by non-architects mm. or by different people and mm. different stakeholders. Yeah. Um, actually, that that was. Uh, Maybe maybe it was not a recipe, but there was a discovery throughout the course. Uh, and the, like my 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 last appeal appeal to you, uh, be selective, was actually my first to them. I think uh, uh, selection is very crucial because, um, and well, let me tell you the story. We started with a, a little play. Uh, you know, to be selective means. Um, uh, the play was two people, two students, played the role of two friends meeting after a year, after graduation. They meet uh, occasionally on, on the airport, right? And, well, hello, and da, 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 I haven't seen you for long, and what happened, and so. And one of the two has three minutes. Hmm? The other one would have two hours to wait, you know? Now, I tell you, oh, my... I have to run in three minutes. What do you tell me in three minutes? Hmm? Now, if you are silly, you start at the very end and say, oh, you know, you remember after the party, I went da 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 After three minutes, I know nothing of your story. Now, if you can do the shortcut, if you can give me the essence of your full year <coughs> within these three minutes, you have been selective and you have you have selected without me knowing. I don't know what you select from. So you as an editor, you are selective. 
Mm? And that's a responsibility because you have, you have the power to, to, to arrange these informations which you hand over to me. I don't know what I miss, right? So this experience, you know, and you know, if you don't tell them how much time they have, you know, then you have to be preventive in your selection. And you don't know how much time your receiver has. Hmm? The receiver of a book, I have, I doubt if people have this courage or this, this passion to read long texts. Hmm? That's why we offer, and maybe that's, this is a consequence from new media, and I hope there are, are enough people who have this, uh, this uh, 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 energy still, but uh, that's why we create this kind of portions where the image can maybe evoke some interest and pose some questions and you say, oh, that's interesting. Maybe the text will, ex the short text will explain the context. And so I think having this, the, the basic experience in editing is that you do the right selection, that you don't suffer too much by what you leave out, or that you are b even become kind of excited by the complexity you create, or the density you create, or this the impact, the the urgency of like the human rights. You know, it's still 700 pages, but it squeezed so much information into that book that the topic becomes so urgent and powerful. And I think if you do that experience once on architecture or whatever, you know, you may, uh, and that was my offer to the students, choose whatever you like. If you collect stamps, you know, <laughs> do a book, do, do an editorial exercise on stamps. Hmm? Tell me the most, show me the most precious stamps worldwide and their history or whatever. It doesn't matter as an, as an experience. But in architecture, I would say that you should uh, respect the, the dilettante as your, as your preferred audience, you know, to communicate amongst professionals. You can give me the full set of plans and I will do the selection. Hmm? But if you communicate to common people, you should be polite and you should pre-select and you arrange and, and you know, and, and you also you also encourage me to use my fantasy, like when we when we when we sequence photographs. You don't you don't show every corner of the building, because you expect the viewer to make combinations to to feel even to 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 enjoy this kind of ah oh, this is this corner and now you know. And I think uh, if without this experience of of being engaged as a viewer as a receiver, um, I may. I may, <coughs> sorry, constantly have this desire to go there and see the building. And that's actually what architecture books try to avoid, you know. People cannot travel all around the world to see every, uh, whatever, doghouse by famous architects, right? So we have to do precious books, you know, representing uh, the, the architecture through the eyes of the, of the author, the editor, the photographer as a personal view. And that's the author's role and the editor's role. Maybe now I make it a little bit complicated, but it was really amazing to see how encouraged the students were while they were a bit irritated by how, how they should take that role beside, besides being an architect. But it fits well. Architect and editor is good. Any other questions? Yeah, H Helene has one. I have a question, and uh, probably we share um, this question a lot, is the relationship between the architect and the book. So, um, and when the architect becomes an editor. Uh, I always thought the book is the most uh, valuable form to express the complexity of architecture, and also by being almost like, like a space, the architect can express uh, very much the concept of his building. And um, the same example that you gave of uh, Le Corbusier was mentioned in a, in a conference about um, you know, creating an icon and uh, branding architecture as the example of the most clever and cunning almost 
tools that he had with, and the vision that by controlling his book, mm -hmm. he would control his image and he would control his client and future. And it was upsetting for me because I don't want to believe mm -hmm. in this. And I wanted to know if what you think about. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one extreme example, but very often there's this difficult boundary between mm -hmm. um, when the architect has the possibility of mm -hmm. manipulating his also image to the public. Yeah, I, I, th I just think that Corbusier is the wrong example to express this because uh, he was a pioneer in the field, right? And uh, uh, well, he, I think he, he may be a good example for a pioneer in self-publishing. You know, if, if self-publishing or Ed Rusha, well, you know, I think we wouldn't have know all these wonderful books if, if he wouldn't be uh, turned off by, by publishers, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just great. So he p self published and Corbusier started in 1912 at the age of 87, da -da -da, yeah, uh, uh, at the age of 25 s writing and, and, you know, publishers at that time were laughing so he had no other chance than to self publish. Now, I think he learned very fast to use the book as, a, as an instrument of propaganda. It was not <coughs> controlling his own image. He was really, uh, I think, he, like Esprit Nouveau, the, the magazine he, he co-founded, was really a messenger of modernity. And I think it would be wrong to blame that, that generation of, of uh, or to actually make them responsible for something that is much newer to me as a tendency. Um, maybe in his, his age and also the collaboration with Hans Gisberger, just to say that from 1954 on, he had for, for almost 10 years until he died, he had one publisher and he published kind of 16 books with that one publisher. And I think there was a growing influence of the publisher like the, the oeuvre Gomple is completely controlled by, by Gisberger. So Corbusier doesn't give that, that uh, a good image. I think Eisenman would be a good uh, example for that absolute control wh where, I, I say it, uh, I talk about a friend, I, I would say it was also a, f a kind of self-defense because at that time in the 60s, later 60s, Everyone thought Eisenman is crazy. You can't, no, no one would ever build that. It was what happened to Saha. She went into painting, uh, not into bookmaking. So you, you kind of defend yourself with an, with an other media, with medium which is maybe not close, but kind of similar in a way and allows the field of creation or, or the freedom of creation. I just don't have experience. I wouldn't work with these kind of architects. So I wouldn't offer service that they will end up with uh, uh, all the publishers. And you don't work for them either. Hmm? But I'd, I know these, these expressions in conferences and uh, they, they uh, and, and those architects are also willing to pay a fortune to keep control. Hmm? And I want you to pay a fortune give up control. <laughs> All right. That was a long evening. I, I okay, appreciate thank you. your staying. Thank you very much again. And let's give another applause for you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>